Tony Renna was an up-and-coming star in the world of open-wheel racing. He had dreamt of racing in the Indy 500 and alongside legends he grew up watching. After a couple years in a test driver role, Renna finally got his chance to race the full 2004 Indy Racing League season with Chip Ganassi Racing. However, tragedy struck just before his big chance. In a private test session at Indianapolis Motor Speedway in late 2003, Renna lost control of his car and suffered one of the most horrific wrecks ever in open wheel racing. Today, we're going to take a dive into Tony's career, the terrible tragedy, and the controversial investigations after his crash. On November 23, 1976, Anthony James Renna was born in Victorville, California, but moved to Orlando at a young age. His parents, Joe and Mary, quickly adopted the nickname Tony. Joe was a former jockey and ran a small meat company. He was an avid race fan, and all three of his children raced quarter midgets. Tony and both of his sisters, Katie and Nicole. Rinna began go-karting at the age of six and was fast almost immediately. As a kid, he was mentored by former racer Ralph Liguri, and this only boosted his speed. Tony was also a great baseball player, and even found himself as a bat boy for MLB games, but made the decision to focus on racing. As Tony grew, he became fixated on open-wheel racing, idolizing drivers like Rick Mears and Al Unser Jr., and was determined to race for Team Penske. He started making all the right steps to becoming a kart racer. He was driving quarter midgets, mini sprints, a little motocross racing and micro sprints, and Rena won. A lot. He won 252 races and two national quarter midget championships before the age of 15. This was a happy time of family and racing for the Rena family. They would pack up the family van with a trailer and travel on most weekends to wherever Tony was racing. Tony's dad would work on the cars that Tony raced, his mom was the timekeeper and manager, while Tony's sisters would watch the car, change tires, and help in any way they could. When Tony was 16, he competed in the Skip Barber Formula Ford Series. It took him a while to find his footing in his first season, but in year two, Tony won eight races and the series championship. Jim O'Brien, an employee of American Driver Development Organization Racing for America, asked Tony if he wanted to race in Europe. Tony was all in, but his dad was unsure because the family's budget was very limited as they could only afford to race part-time in the 1995 Barber Dodge Pro Series. However, in mid-1995, O'Brien offered the chance again, and the Renna family agreed. Tony tested a Formula 3 car and impressed several teams, but a couple deals fell through ultimately due to funding. However, he did manage to get six races in the British Formula 3 Class B Championship and ended the six-race stint with three poles and three podiums. By 1996, the Rena family's budget was nearly depleted due to the Europe stint, and it seemed the risk didn't pay off. But Tony was able to compete in the 96 Barber Dodge Pro Series season full-time and finished 7th in the points with 3 podiums and 2 poles. He won the Rookie of the Year award and received two massive scholarships. One was the Team USA scholarship, where he partnered with Jerry Nadeau in a Formula Opel Lotus car, and the team placed second at the 1996 EFDA Nations Cup at Donington Park. After a few part-time opportunities in the Barber Dodge Pro Series and USF 2000 Series, Rena landed a full-time ride in Indy Lights for the 1998 season, racing for Matco Raceworks. In this season, he had a win and six top tens en route to an eighth place in the standings. In the middle of the next Indy Lights season, Matco Raceworks was nailed with a year-long suspension after illegal engine modifications were made to Rena's teammate's car. Tony was out of luck as he was still contracted to race for Matco, but he quickly turned to NASCAR for employment. He was looking for rides in the Bush Series and Truck Series, then Team USA, that was funding Tony's ride, was made aware of this. They didn't want to lose their driver to a rival series, so they arranged for Tony to be broken out of a contract with Matco and found him a new ride at PacWest Racing. He was able to take home a podium in Milwaukee with the team, but then crashed out in three straight races and DNQ'd at Michigan. He was able to make one more start that season at Fontana and finish sixth. 
Rena clearly had the speed, but seemed to make too many mistakes in desperation to impress in his limited 1999 schedule. Even given some poor results, Pac West signed him to a five-year contract extension and paired him with 19-year-old Scott Dixon full-time in 2000. Unfortunately for Tony, he was completely outshined by Dixon. Dixon had six wins and won the championship, meanwhile Rena only had three podiums. Rena was the team's developmental driver for the season and had multiple test sessions for Pac West's car operation. Originally, Rena had a 2001 kart ride lined up with PacWest Racing, but the seat was ultimately given to Dixon. Rena's five-year contract was terminated, and he was left without a ride. Rena had one-off rides in various racing leagues, but ultimately he wanted to race in kart. He visited garages, wrote letters to teams, and tried networking with many influential figures, but could not land a ride. As a 24-year-old on his own, he needed to support himself, so he found employment at Derek Daly Performance Driving Academy at Las Vegas Motor Speedway as a driving instructor. He also raced in NASCAR late model stock car events at Las Vegas on a weekly basis, driving for Dick Cobb. However, Tony's luck changed whenever he landed a deal with Kelly Racing in the IRL after networking with team owner Tom Kelly the year prior. This was not a traditional deal, as Tony would coach Jason Priestley, who was a development driver for Kelly Racing. This was a big deal because Priestley was a famous actor who was actually a talented racer, and with all the potential headlines and sponsorship he could bring for the team, Tom was thrilled with the idea of having an experienced racer and driver coach being essentially a 24-7 mentor. Priestley and Rena became good friends throughout this partnership, as they were together constantly through 2002. Rena worked closely on race day with Kelly Racing's IRL team, as he was also a test and a replacement driver for the team. However, in July of 2002, the team's driver, the legendary Al Unzer Jr., left racing to go into alcoholic rehabilitation. Rena got the call up to the team to make his first starts in the IRL. Rena was lined up to finish the season with six races left, and he knew this was his shot. Tony made his debut at Nashville and ran a respectable 10th place. The next race at Michigan, the site of his only Indy Lights win, was when he made a real splash. Rena qualified 10th and finished an incredible 4th place in only a second start, beating drivers like Sam Hornish Jr. and Elio Castroneves. He followed that up with another great run at Kentucky, but unfortunately DNF'd the following two races. He finished the season strong with a ninth place. Unfortunately, he didn't have a ride in 2002 because Kelly Racing ended up having financial issues. Tom Kelly kept Rena heavily involved in 2003 and desperately wanted a deal to work out with Rena to race. Tom was able to put a deal together to enter Rena in the Indy 500, and once again, Tony delivered big. He qualified 8th and ran in the top 10 all day, and left Indianapolis with a 7th place finish. Chip Ganassi took note of Rena's impressive performances, and worked on a deal behind the scenes to get him as a driver. In October, Ganassi was able to make the offer of Rena's career, a guaranteed full-time ride in the 2004 IndyCar season racing for his superpower team. Rena told Tom Kelly about the offer, but since he couldn't guarantee a race seat for Rena, Tom ended up letting him go to Chip Ganassi Racing. Rena made his first on-track appearance with the team on October 22nd of 2003 at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Unfortunately, this would also be his last. At 9 a.m., Tony was testing Firestone tires in a private test and set sail on a long run. On his fourth lap, Tony entered turn three at nearly 230 miles per hour, just below the normal racing line. He lost control of his car and spun sideways. Rena started heading for the infield grass as his car lifted up. His car became more airborne and lifted over the grass and headed towards the outside wall. The bottom of Rena's car struck the outside fence above the wall, causing an impact of more than 100 Gs. As the car hit the fence, it split into two. The fence post snapped, and debris scattered across the track and grandstand. 
it was reported that the first layer of grandstands behind the fence were completely mangled and destroyed. And tragically, Rena had no shot of surviving the devastating crash. Medical personnel arrived at the scene quickly, but were unable to restart his heart. Tony was rushed to a local hospital, but was pronounced dead upon arrival. Tony Renna was 26 at the time, and was set to be married just four weeks later. The week after Renna's death, the Indy Racing League began an investigation involving Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Chip Ganassi Racing, and Firestone. The test was private, so there were no photographers, media members, or fans to be eyewitnesses of the wreck, or to take photos. However, the photos I have been using were caught by a news helicopter that went to the speedway after the public had learned of the incident. The black box of Rena's car, which holds important onboard electric data, was severely damaged in the crash, which meant officials could not download the content. The black box was sent to the original manufacturer, where they were able to pull some data from it. On December 19th, the results of the investigation were released to the public. The report concluded they didn't have a 100% conclusive reason as to why the incident occurred, as there were many unknown possibilities that could have contributed to it. This could have been anything from wind, to the tire temperatures, to a driver's mistake, track conditions, or anything in between. Rest of the report focused on why Rena's car lifted up into the air the way it did. Ultimately, the Indy Racing League concluded the spectator fences worked as designed and Rena's speed was similar to other accidents at the time. Now, honestly, this is a pretty lame finding, as the Indy Racing League basically said, well, we did everything we could do, it just happens. There wasn't much accountability on either side, especially the IRLs. They basically accepted that this is something that could happen again to any other driver. Also, many people online have pointed out how bad this accident could have been if it happened on race day. Considering half a car's worth of debris flew into the grandstand at 200 miles per hour and completely mangled a section of grandstands, this accident could have seen a Le Mans 1955 level of disaster, which totaled 82 deaths. And honestly, this isn't an overreaction. So, it is surprising to say the least that the Indy Racing League was pretty much content with this. The last piece to this investigation is a pretty recent speculation of track security cameras having footage or photos of the accident. Now, this seems unlikely as many times throughout the investigation, authorities and Indy Racing League officials referred to there being no footage to aid the investigation. However, there are rumors of Tony George, former president and CEO of Indianapolis, hiding crash footage from authorities and even going to a nearby gas station to seize their tapes. This is probably false, but it seems to be an ongoing debate. Tony Renna was taken way too early, and this was just before his biggest shot in racing. It was undeniably, unimaginably hard for his family to get through this as they had supported him for 20 years to get to this point. Despite this, Joe Renna showed up to races over the next couple of seasons with Chip Ganassi Racing to support Darren Manning, the man who took over the seat that was supposed to be Tony's. It is a very difficult situation, Manning said. It's something very few people, very few times have ever had to deal with, really. It was mixed emotions because I was excited that I got to drive, but I had never been in a situation before where I was replacing someone who was involved in a fatal accident. Obviously, I was upset, but the team welcomed me with open arms. Rena's family was very supportive after the accident. Tony's father and I had a nice chat, and he wished me all the best, and he told me if there was anything I needed from him, he would treat me like one of his own. That's it for this video. I hope you did enjoy. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I know it wasn't a NASCAR video, but I still hope you guys took something from this. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.